Hello, I'm here today to talk to you about the impacts on children of wireless radiation. And I wanna thank um, my, my colleagues uh, from Cyprus for giving me this opportunity to address the 17th educational seminar on the impact of the environment on the child. I particularly wanna talk with you about what we now know about wireless radiation, reflecting my four decades of experience as the founding director of the Board on Environmental Studies and Toxicology at the US National Academy of Sciences, where I led the group that worked to develop the ban on smoking in the indoor environment, particularly because we wanted to protect children. I also was honored to be a member of the team that worked for years documenting the ways that patterns of greenhouse gases affected public health as part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I was also honored uh, to be appointed by President Clinton and confirmed by the US Senate to a official position in that administration. I've worked with the World Health Organization, the World Bank, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and numerous institutions uh, around the world. So it gives me a special pleasure to speak with you today about a problem that I think merits serious attention. And that is that decades of research <clears throat> have documented serious biological effects of cell phone and other microwave radiation. In fact, I was just looking today at some of the research produced in the 1960s and 70s by the Russians and evaluated by the US that showed that microwave radiation could affect hearing, vision, and a host of other things. And this research was done over many decades and it is documented in my book, Disconnect, The Truth About Cell Phone Radiation. That book was published more than a decade ago. And I would urge you to look at it because there's not one word in it that is incorrect. The government limits that are used to evaluate this cell phone radiation have to be updated because they are more than a quarter of a century old. They have not been updated since 1996. Now, when it comes to the types of evidence that are relevant to establishing the biological impacts of electromagnetic fields, we basically have three major sources. We have models that we develop with computers that estimate exposure that takes place in the brain and the body. And I'll share some of those with you in a moment. We have experiments that have been conducted under controlled conditions with cell cultures and whole animals, where we take exposures that are controlled carefully so that there's a Faraday cage preventing other exposures. And we expose the animals or the cell cultures taken from animals or humans to cell phone and other microwave radiation. And then finally, there's human clinical and epidemiologic studies. And those studies are the most complicated. They take the longest to do because well, for example, <clears throat> rodents live for two years and we estimate that in their two year lifetime, we give them as much exposure as humans receive in our 70 plus years. For humans, we have to observe them. We cannot, of course, deliberately expose them to something that we think could be a hazard. So we're left with case reports or case control studies where we compare people who have a disease with those who do not and ask whether or not there are significant differences in their use of cell phones or other agents. We can also do prospective studies following people through time, and those are quite costly and are very difficult to do well, or cross-sectional studies where we take a snapshot and compare children in terms of those with behavioral problems and those without, and again, ask questions about their relative use of cell phones and other things. And finally, we can look at time trends. Trends in disease do not tell us what causes those trends, but they're very valuable for providing clues about my, what might be underlying them. So let's start with what we know about modeling and measurement. Cell phone radiation limits were set in 1996 using a computer that accounted only for short-term heating. These tests use a large male plastic dummy. The head was, would be the equivalent of about 
seven kilograms in weight or <clears throat> more than 12 pounds. And the tests used a dummy for the brain and body of a guy that would be about um, 90 kilograms in weight or more than 200 pounds. The developing brain and body was not considered, nor were the long-term effects on the environment, on birds and bees and trees. Children are uniquely vulnerable. They are developing, they have thinner skulls with more fluid inside their brains. They have relatively smaller heads and what they have what's called higher dialectical properties. The dialectical property of the air is one. The dialectical property of a child's brain is about 70, meaning it can absorb 70 times more than air. The dialectical property of the human brain of an adult is about 30. So a child overall can absorb twice as much into their brain. And if you look at the bone marrow of the skull, remember the skull is of course dense in older adults, but it's very thin in children. And because of that, children can absorb 10 times more radiation through their thinner skulls compared to adults. But interestingly, up to 30 times more exposure into the hippocampus. And the hippocampus, as you know, is critical to memory and balance and impulse control. And that's why the American Academy of Pediatrics have warned that children should not be using cell phones. They are not toys and their bodies are not designed to absorb this kind of radiation. This slide, which is again a, adapted from work done with our colleagues in Brazil, Alvaro de Sales, uh, Juliana Ferreira, um, and other work that we've done with Claudio Fernandez, shows you how much exposure gets into the frontal lobe, the nose, and the cheek of a six-year-old using a standard Wi-Fi tablet. The most important thing to realize here is that the eye has no cooling mechanism. And you can see that the highest exposures here shown by the yellow and white color get into the eye of a child who's holding this device. They're called tablets. They belong on tables. They do not belong on the laps of children. In this slide, we model the exposure of a phone in the pocket, which is a very, of course, a very common thing. If we look in more detail at the modeling that we've done, we have used models that have been approved by the US Food and Drug Administration, three-dimensional modeling. And that modeling has allowed us to estimate exposure into the male reproductive system, which turns out to get the highest exposures of any part of a human body, because the testis and the penis have no protection. But it's this exposure modeling that allows us to understand why it's important to reduce exposures and how exposures do get into the testis. When we look at further exposure information, what we have is information from the French where they looked at cell phones violating radiation limits. And they found, when they looked at 900 phones that they took off the shelf and studied them. And they measured them at the manufacturer's separation distance, which was between five millimeters to 2.5 centimeters off the body. So that manufacturers test their phones however they want to. And that has been the rule until very recently. When the manufacturers tested their phones at these different distances, they got levels of radiation that were below those allowed following the ICNRP standards, the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection. That group, a self-appointed, self-monitored group, set standards only to avoid heating after six minutes on the phone only to avoid heating the brain or the body. It ignores entirely the experimental evidence that I'm about to show you that cell phone radiation can damage sperm, can damage the brain, and can increase the risk of cancer of the brain, the thyroid, and elsewhere. So the French government tested these phones and under the stimulation of our colleagues, Mark Arazi and PhoneGate, they released data that showed that when you tested a phone at zero millimeters at body contact, 
literally in the pocket. The exposure differences were substantial. So let's look at the first Polaroid Pro 881A. There was almost seven times more exposure when tested on the body compared to the manufacturer test. If you looked at the BlackBerry, there was also more than seven times more exposure. If you looked at the Nokia Lumina, it was also uh, substantially greater. And if you looked at the iPhone 5, which is now history, the exposure was almost triple what the manufacturer reported. Professor Om Gandhi published an analysis of this work that showed that if you use US limits, the levels were even higher. So as a result, we know that the cell phones, when used the way normal people use them, emit much more radiation than the limits allow. Because of this, the European Union has changed their requirements and phones now in Europe have to be tested at five millimeters off the body. Now, five millimeters is not as good as zero because again, every single millimeter gives you 15% more exposure. So five millimeters is gonna give you at least 75% more exposure, almost double, but it's better than what was allowed before. And we are encouraged that the European Union is continuing to examine this issue, goaded by our brave colleagues at PhoneGate Alert. When the Swiss government looked at experimental evidence, which I'm turning to now, they put together an expert group chaired by Mikey Mevison, one of the most renowned toxicologists in their country and in the world, to ask the question, was there evidence based on studies in cell cultures, as well as studies in whole animals, was there evidence of any health effect from exposure to electromagnetic fields, specifically oxidative stress. Oxidation is known to induce free radicals that can be damaging to every cell in the body. And this expert group for the government issued a report quite recently in which it concluded that more than half of the cell culture studies and most of the whole animal studies showed clear evidence of increased oxidative stress caused either by Wi-Fi radiation or low levels of electromagnetic fields. And as a result of that, this expert group concluded that the young and the elderly may react less efficiently to the damaging effects of oxidative stress from electromagnetic fields and therefore may need special protections. Keep in mind, that the, there are no special protections for children that are issued today by the Food and Drug Administration for the FCC or any of the other groups that have reviewed the situation in the United States. Fortunately, a number of countries, as we will see at the end, have issued special precautions for children. In 2012, the Bioinitiative Report issued a rationale for biologically based exposure standards. And what's interesting about that report, which is updated recently in 2020, is that it cites studies that go back to the 1970s in Russia and the United States, including, as one example, studies showing damage to the hippocampus, damage to repair in the hippocampus after exposure to microwave radiation published in 1982. And yet all of the standards that were issued in 1996 ignored this science and said, the only thing we have to do is protect the body and brain from heating. Let's look at what we now know from some other experimental work done by our colleagues in Turkey, uh, Odachi, Bas, and Suleyman Kaplan, published in, nine, in 2008. What they did was to take animals and expose them prenatally, that is the pregnant animal, to wireless radiation at levels you can get from a cell phone at that time. The control cells are on the top. And again, you see nice borders and circles around the cells at uh, 35, uh, 25 micrometer 
magnification. If you look at the exposed cells that were exposed throughout pregnancy, the first thing you see is that there are fewer of them. There's less purple all overall. And the next thing you see is the majority of them are lacking in cell membranes. This is clear evidence that wireless radiation impacts the developing brain, but remember that evidence has been around uh, since the 1970s and 80s. In addition, other research done by the National Institutes of Health has shown that just 50 minutes, that's five zero minutes of having a phone next to the brain can alter brain activity, particularly of glucose in the brain. Studies have been done with animals also showing this at Yale University, and other studies have now been done with teenagers and with children, again showing that prenatally exposed children have hyperactivity and other problems that are significantly greater in those whose parents used cell phones throughout their pregnancy. Now, what makes this work so fascinating is that now in 2021, we have further refinement of the same finding. This work here with the violet stained sections of the hippocampus show the clear evidence again uh, of, of damage. You can see that in the control cells, um, which are in uh, D at, at the top, and you see more cells, and then you see more damage to what are called the granular parts of the dentate gyrus. And the dentate gyrus is a critical part of the hippocampus. So this is the 60 minutes exposure. And if you look for a moment at the 60 minutes of exposure compared to the 40 minutes, you see that there's even fewer cells evident uh, and more damage in the sense that the boundaries have been smushed, the cell walls, which are important to integrity, have been damaged. And the damage to the rodent brain means that the nuclei, the center of the cells, have basically been compromised and, is, and they have degenerated. Now, what's important about this is that the hippocampus of all mammals is involved in thinking, in balance, in memory. And what we're seeing here is clear evidence that has been repeated over many years confirming this damaging effect. Similar results have been reported by other researchers uh, led by uh, a team with Hassan recently as well, showing the excess in free radical formation, just like the Swiss government said, and showing changes in the testis and the spermatogonic cells, how they are shaped and formed. And you see, that there is a tremendous difference here in the cells with integrity and those that are lacking boundaries. So if you look at D, you see the most damage and the test system uh, to the rodent was exposing them to 4G mobile phone radiation and seeing what happened to their cells within the testis, the lytic cells, the Sertoli cells. This is where, in fact, sperm are made. And here again, you're seeing large, wide lumen, as opposed to nice cell walls that you would see in A, you see how the walls are all around, you see circles around them. Those are what cells are supposed to look like. In B, you see the white in the middle, they're missing the nuclei. And by the time you get to D, you see cells themselves have lost their boundary. So now if we look at, again, the diagram that is, was developed by our colleagues in Brazil, we know that the testis absorbs the most exposure in the human body. The so-called testicular barrier is actually a hundred times more vulnerable to exposure to chemicals and radiation than any other part of the human body. So it's far from being a barrier, it's more like a, a thin skin, the thinnest skin that can absorb the most. If you think about it, the thicker the skin, the more resilient it's going to be. The thinner the skin, the more it can absorb. And again, this diagram shows you that absorption. 
Now, what's particularly important to understand with respect to the experimental work that's been done is that studies have shown effects below the current safety limits. Remember, those were set just to avoid heating. Those limits clearly do not reflect what we're showing you here today, which is many studies find consistent evidence of chronic long-term effects that occur over longer periods of exposure. And the current model that's for all of the world's 6 billion phones today assumes that the only effect to be avoided is after six minutes of talking to avoid heating the brain or body. Here is a study that was done by Joachim Lerchel uh, in Germany. And what he asked was, is there any evidence for synergy? That is, is there any evidence that if you expose animals to a known carcinogen, uh, in this case, DMBA, which is known to cause liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, and you also expose them to levels of radiation lower than those that are currently allowed, as well as levels that are at the, le at the current level. And what this study showed was that if you take, if you look at the black bar on the right, you see that the carcinogen exposed animals, exposed to DMBA, developed significantly more tumors than the control animals. The control animals are on the left black bar. They developed very, very small number of liver cancers spontaneously. If you gave them the carcinogen, DMBA, they developed three times more liver carcinogens. But if you expose them to levels of radiation that are actually lower than those currently allowed, 0.04 watts per kilogram. You see in the first red bar, that exposure increases the number of cancers of the liver by double, double what you get with the carcinogen alone. And then you get a, an increase as well with exposures that are at the current limit seen in the next two bars and it's really interesting to see that the combined exposures give you a non-linear effect so that the findings might help to understand why you're seeing an increased incidence of brain cancer, thyroid cancer, and other cancers in heavier users of mobile phone. Now, with respect to the vulnerability of the sperm, I want to add that other studies have actually taken a computer and put it over a bunch of petri dishes filled with sperm. And that laptop computer was designed so that no heat came out of it because we all know that heat damages sperms. And four hours of having that radiation alone going into these samples of sperm in petri dishes clearly caused damage to that sperm. On the bar graph on the left, you see a measure of the percent of the DNA that shows fragmentation. So instead of having nice integrity like the double helix of DNA should, the DNA is broken. And the amount of broken DNA is obviously three times higher in that exposed to the laptop Wi-Fi. So laptops no longer should be called laptops. Tablets should always be on tables, never on laps, and never on the bodies of children. If you combine all of the in vitro studies that have been done up to 2015, my colleague Malka Halgamug in Australia and Melbourne, who is an expert in machine learning, and I produced this analysis in environmental research, looking at over 300 peer reviewed publications with over a thousand different experimental observations in them, all using in vitro models. And we found when you looked carefully at those studies that looked at less differentiated cell types, for example, the human sperm, the epithelium, the stem cell of, of children, when you looked at cells that are faster growing, those cells that grow more quickly and are less mature are more vulnerable to damage. If you look at all the studies done, however, a lot of studies use mature lymphocytes. Mature cells, are more resistant 
to the effects of radiation. The younger the cell, the faster it grows, the more vulnerable it is. Think of it like this. If you try to say what we call a tongue twister quickly, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. And then you say it again, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. And the faster you say it, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Eventually, the faster you go, the more mistakes you make. That's what happens with cells as well. The faster they grow, the impact of radiation can be much greater. Now we turn to the human data. And here we have trends, but we can't say what's causing them. But this is from the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. And this similar trend is occurring in many countries around the world. And I urge my colleagues watching this to look in their own countries to see this. If you look at the trend in overall cancer, it's going down. And the reason is because the majority of cancers until very recently were all related to smoking. And as fewer people are smoking, the cancer rates overall are dropping. But if you look at age specific rates and specific types of cancer not related to smoking, what you conclude is that there's a dramatic increase in pediatric cancer, specifically brain, liver, and thyroid cancers. In addition, I'm going to show you increases in colorectal cancers. And many of these have occurred since 2010. Well, my colleagues and I did publish a paper recently showing that there is a fourfold increase in this rare cancer, rectal cancer, in young Americans under the age of 40 since 2010. Here are some unexplained increases in colorectal cancer that we found in this case, these are US data. And what you see if you look at those, if you look at the age group zero to 49 on the top left of this graph, you see a steady increase, right? And the increase is from 1995. I, if you look at a more detailed analysis of the age, there's a more dramatic increase that starts in 2010. And I'll show that to you in, in a moment. The good news is that mortality has dropped because treatment has improved, but even mortality is slightly increasing for the younger age groups now. If you look from, again, 2000, 2005 to 2015, in the top right graph, you see a steady increase in both males and females after years of decline. If you look at the bottom two graphs, of for ages 50 to 64 for both incidence and mortality, they both had been dropping, although incidence has started to come back up for males and females again since 2010. The next graph is quite complex, and I want to take a moment to explain it to you. We have looked at what's called generational risk. Generational risk asks, what is the risk of younger generations compared to that of older generations. And what these rainbow of, of lines are showing you is colon cancer on the left, rectal cancer on the right. You see the decline in the older age groups for colon and rectal cancer at the top. All of those are dropping. But once you get to the age group 50 to 54, both colon and especially rectal cancer are increasing look at the age group 35 to 39. If you look at rectal cancer in the age groups 35 to 39, 30 to 34, 25 to 29, and the youngest 20 to 24, the rates indicated on the left side of the graph, which is in fact a log scale, the rates have dramatically increased, actually more than fourfold for the very youngest for rectal cancer. So what can we say about this increase in colorectal cancer in young adults? Other studies, experimental studies, exposed colorectal cancer cells in the laboratory to radiofrequency radiation and showed they were exquisitely sensitive. Phones, when they're in your pocket, they are on, they are smart, and they are looking for a signal from the tower, where are you, here I am, and so long as they are turned on, 
they are going to be radiating into you. And this effect has been demonstrated experimentally that colorectal cancer cells are exquisitely sensitive. And now we have this fourfold increase since 2010. It's a rare cancer. It's less rare now. My colleagues and I believe that a part of this increase in rectal cancer in young adults is due to cell phones in the pocket. You tell me what else could be involved. We know that obesity and CAT scans are factors that need to be explored as well, but certainly having a two-way microwave radiating a device close to the rectum is not a good idea. The American Cancer Society funded a study of thyroid cancer, and they showed increased risk with regular cell phone use in people that had a particular single nucleotide excision affecting DNA repair. This is a common SNP, single nucleotide excision, a common one, but it showed that those who use phones for just one hour a day, who also carried this particular SNP, had doubled risk of thyroid cancer compared to other people. Again, regular cell phone use, a study published in 2020. We go back and look at exposures and you see the male reproductive system is still the most vulnerable, but the thyroid is obviously getting a lot of exposure when the phone is held close to the head. The thyroid is located right in the center of, of the neck. But with respect to the testis exposure, we know that colorectal cancer is um, also affected by the exposure that goes into the testis, it goes into the rectum. That exposure is extremely important for both the testis and the rectum. When my colleague, Anthony B. Miller, who is a distinguished scientist who's published more than 600 articles in the past, and I and others reviewed the evidence, we concluded that there was strong evidence from combining the work that I've shown you that wireless radio frequency radiation does cause cancer in humans. And that study was published in environmental research in, in 2018. The summary overall of the experimental studies is that contrary to the assertions of industry, there is consistent evidence of damage to the brain and reproductive systems from Wi-Fi and radio frequency microwave radiation. In particular, the US National Toxicology Program constitutes the flagship testing system for, for all of these things. And they showed significant increases in DNA damage in the frontal cortex of the brain in male mice and in the blood cells of female mice and hippocampus of male rats. But also, of course, most importantly, this study found clear evidence of cancer in animals exposed in their two-year lifetime to the levels of radiation that humans will get in our 70 plus years. That's an extremely important thing to note, that the protocols used by the National Toxicology Program are applied to the testing of drugs and chemicals and radiation and have been designed over four decades and standardized. And yet in America, the Food and Drug Administration that requested this study rejected its results because they were inconvenient to the industry. They ignored the findings that I've shown you here today. They ignored the findings of the Ramazzini Institute uh, in, in Bologna, which showed that even at lower levels of radio frequency, <clears throat> like those of a base station, there was significantly increased tumors. Other research on damage has been done by a number of respected colleagues in Turkey, including Suleyman Dazdak, Suleyman Kaplan, and Nezrin Sahan <clears throat> at Dikle University, Anakuz Meyuz, and Gazi University. And they have shown altered expression of messenger RNA, decreased sperm counts and uh, vitality of the sperm, decreased weight of the reproductive organs of the male, and decreased weight of the brain. So these results 
really should be a wake up call to all of us because they consistently find greater effects in the younger the animal, when they're exposed, the greater the effects. Similar works have been reported by colleagues in Nigeria showing vascular congestion and damage in brain tissue, just like that reported by Henry Lai and Vijay Singh in 1994. So it, again, we are keep repeating the findings of this damage. Now, this damage shown in experimental animals has also been reported in humans monitored with respect to their blood and, and, and evaluated with respect to how far away they lived from a mobile phone base station. And this work by Indian colleagues took blood from people who lived within 80 meters of a tower compared to those who lived more than 300 meters away. And keep in mind that all of these towers in India operated at one tenth of the allowed exposures by the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection. And what they showed is looking at the blood, not interviewing people, not asking if they were anxious, just looking at their blood, they found exactly what the Swiss government scientists had predicted, reduced antioxidant status because of increased free radical formation, increased reactive oxygen species in those exposed to more cell phone radiation. Decreases in glutathione, which is critical to repair of damage, and uh, decreased catalase superoxide dismutase, all of which are involved in repairing DNA damage. So people living closer to cell towers have fewer chemicals in their body that naturally fight off damage to DNA. Other studies in children have shown problems in their memory with studies done in, by Swiss colleagues, including Martin Rusley, have shown that teenagers have problems with memory of, of figures. Significant damage occurs to their ability to remember things the more they use their cell phone. The study has, was first produced in 2015 and replicated with strengthened results. Now, again, remember, the hippocampus is critical here. So we have published research on electromagnetic fields showing cancer, showing DNA damage, showing effects on memory and sperm and brain, showing combined effects. Other research I haven't discussed indicates headaches, oxidative stress, damage to bees and insects and trees. And again, the younger the organism, the greater the damage. So as a consequence of all of this, we're really delighted that the Cyp Cyprus National Committee on the Environment and Child Health, the Pan-Cyprian Medical Association, the Athens Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Israel Pediatric Society, and many others are advising on how to reduce exposure to cell phone radiation. Children should not be using phones. And if you look to our website, we have video and pictures such as the one I'm showing you now. You can install a connector into even an iPad or a MacBook or a regular computer with a USB port. And that allows you then to connect your ethernet connection through to the computer. In New Hampshire, a state commission recently re issued a really important report. This commission, consisting of experts in electronic engineering, as well as medicine, looked at all of the evidence before us today on this issue. They were quite impressed with the fact that before the pandemic, Swiss Re issued a report saying that they found the risks posed by 5G to human health and the environment to be, quote, off the leash, meaning out of control. They compared the risk of 5G to the risk of asbestos, which we know bankrupted several insurance groups. And because of that, the New Hampshire State Commission, consisting of members of their legislature as well, recommended wired networks in schools not Wi-Fi, 
they recommended creating radiation free zones in commercial and public buildings and having health agencies develop an educational campaign using multimedia resources, especially for pregnant women and babies. And they asked for mandatory setbacks so that cell towers cannot be located on street lamps at your bedroom window. This is a very important recommendation because right now there is major efforts around the world to put new 5G antennas right on street lamps, many of which in the urban environment can be quite close to where people live, sleep, and work. The commission also issued its report um, supporting an independent study of 5G health effects and um, replacing Wi-Fi with hardwired connections wherever possible. Hundreds of scientists are now calling to halt 5G, to reduce public health exposure and enact environmental protections. And this list of many of them, again, includes um, those that we're happy to work with here in, in Cyprus, like the National Committee on the Environment and Child Health, about the international policies to reduce EMF. France, Belgium, and Israel all warn about the use of cell phones by children. France has banned Wi-Fi in kindergarten, reducing it in elementary school, and children are not to bring phones to school. In Belgium, they banned advertising of phones or design of phones for children. The French government in 2019, in 2019, issued co consumer information should be on the device and made available easily so that people can see it, telling them keep radio equipment away from the stomachs of pregnant women and teenagers. That's official advice in France. And they suggested avoiding nighttime communications and frequency and duration of calls, particularly for children and adolescents. In Cyprus, there's been an awareness campaign directed at parents, teens, and pregnant women. We're delighted to see the advertisements that appeared on buses, warning that children need special protection. And schools have been directed to remove Wi-Fi from elementary classrooms. The Archbishop Macarios Hospital has removed Wi-Fi from pediatric intensive care units. So many nations have taken steps. A wonderful meeting was held during the pandemic online and can be watched by any of you that care to learn more about this issue, organized as a major medical conference. And again, Dr. Stella Ikalidu uh, participated and shared with us some of the exciting things that are in development in Cyprus but this meeting was targeted to clinicians to identify the causes of illness that are associated with electromagnetic fields and showing that there are many different chronic illnesses in children and others that can be reduced substantially or prevented if exposures to electromagnetic fields are reduced. There's clinical evidence on it. And there's also evidence of how to treat people who have electromagnetic illness. And anyone who wants more information can find it by looking at this major conference, which is now available online. Here are some of the safety cards that are available that you can download and copy, including especially information for young men and children, as well as why and how to reduce breast cancer risk by never keeping a phone in the bra, something that busy young women do with some frequency. If you want more information on all of this, please go to our website, ehtrust.org. We'd love to hear from you. And please feel free to share this video with all of your skeptical friends and family members. We need people to understand that wireless microwave radiation has clear damaging effects. And the further away you can be from that radiation, the safer and healthier you can be. And we urge that nations and professional societies join in calling for 
stopping 5G until we have information on its long-term chronic effects on human health and the environment. Thank you very much.